welcome everyone. I can see that we're uh, getting folks sucked in from the waiting room. So welcome to our June uh, social hour. Uh, appreciate everybody's participation. And uh, it looks like for the most part, um, we've got folks who kind of know the drill. So um, once you're in, in session, you're welcome to leave your camera on. That way we can see you and interact with you. But we understand that sometimes you're maybe in between things. And so we want to participate, but maybe not be on camera. So that is totally acceptable. Um, and so go ahead and in the chat, if you would um, introduce yourself and let us know where you're coming from uh, today. And uh, that way we can see where you guys are from. Um, for those of you who, uh, I think we have a couple new people on board with us this evening. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Morgan. I'm the Hunter Education Coordinator for the department and I'm based out of Albuquerque. And so again, welcome. And I will go ahead and pass the baton um, over to Colleen because uh, in my screen, she's just directly below me. So I'll pass it on to Colleen and we'll go ahead and uh, introduce the rest of the staff and um, our special guests for the evening. Good evening, ladies. My name is Colleen Payne. I'm the public information specialist for the Southwest area, uh, working out of the Las Cruces department for the uh, Department of Game and Fish. And I think Stephanie, you're up next. Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie. I am the new assistant hunter education coordinator um, out of the Albuquerque office. And this is my first week, so I'm really excited to be joining you guys today. Oh. We're happy to have you, Stephanie. Yes, yes. Stephanie, we're excited to have you and um, have you put, be a part of our Ladies Social Hour team. So welcome. Um, I'm just Jana Bickford. I am the Assistant Chief of Education, also out of the Albuquerque office, um, currently at my house because I got to sneak out a little early today and come home to, to do the social hour from my house. So um, thank you guys for joining us. I'm excited to hear this topic. It's a little different from what we've done in the past, and um, but I think it's going to be full of ton of great information. So Jessica and Sarah, I'm so glad that you're here tonight. We're so happy to be here. Yeah, with that, um, we can just jump in um, to you guys and uh, let you take it away, so. Fantastic. Good. Uh, my name is Jessica. I am the Communications and Outreach Manager here at New Mexico Wildlife Center. Um, and I'm Sarah, I'm the Staff Veterinarian here. And I'm gonna go ahead and get our presentation going here. Can everyone see our slides? Almost, yeah, there we go. There we go, okay, we might have a bit of a lag here. Um, so we are from New Mexico Wildlife Center, which is based in um, Espanola. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit kind of about what our center does and how you can help us and how you can help um, wildlife since you're gonna be out there and probably finding a lot of animals that might need help. So just to start a bit about our center. Um, so we are located in Espanola, 30 minutes north of Santa Fe. So just kind of south of Espanola. Um, we're a nonprofit and our mission is to connect people and wildlife for an abundant tomorrow. And there's two main programs at our center. We have our education side and our rehabilitation side. So our education side has about 35 non-releasable ambassador animals that we utilize for education programs that occur all throughout the year. We generally reach about 7,000 people each year um, and we do virtual programs which reaches um, folks all over New Mexico and kind of um, throughout the United States as well. Our education side is also open to visitors Mondays through Saturdays from 9 to 4 so we get kind of a steady stream of visitors coming through um, to see our ambassador animals. Now today I'm going to talk a lot more about our wildlife hospital side, which is where Dr. Sarah works. Hello. Um, so I uh, got my veterinary degree from the University of Tennessee, um, and then I had been volunteering here for a while um, and became full time last fall. Um, so uh, I am here all the time now. <laughs> um, so just a little background about our wildlife hospital. Uh, we admit between 800 and 1000 patients every year. It just depends on the year and what's happening with wildlife and who's interacting with what. Um, our goal is always to release the animal back to the wild. Um, we do have about a 60% release rate, so we're super proud of that. We're thrilled with every single release, um, so that's great. 
Um, and then I'm here, and in addition to me, there are three full-time licensed wildlife rehabilitators with a variety of experience behind them. Um, and then we also always have a team of interns and volunteers. So uh, we do take traditionally college students, but it certainly doesn't have to be um, anyone over 18 <laughs> as uh, a summer intern where it's a more uh, specific sort of 40 hour week program. And then we take volunteers all the time. They usually spend either a morning or an afternoon with us every single week. Um, animals are generally brought to our center by members of the public. Um, that's the most common, but we also get animals uh, from animal control officers, uh, game and fish COs, uh, and then various volunteer transporters. Um, and we are open every single day of the year um, and we're available uh, as a hospital. Um, the uh, nature center side of our facility um, is not open to the public every day of the year, but we highly publicize when we're open and when we're not open. Um, our, uh, we are available to answer questions by phones every day of the week. And uh, we also answer a lot of questions via email, um, especially when people have photos or videos of concern, something weird they're seeing, um, you know, what is the this animal, a lot of that, um, and we're happy to do that all the time. Um, a little bit about what we have at our facility, because we're, we're a little bit out of the way, so, and we don't have uh, the public generally in our wildlife hospital, so what the heck is back here behind these doors? Uh, we do have a digital x-ray, which is great. Um, we also use our oxygen concentrators quite frequently, um, not for altitude sickness, <laughs> uh, for patients that have issues with their uh, like brain trauma or lung trauma, uh, sometimes with infections like upper respiratory infections or pneumonia. Uh, we have a portable anesthesia unit that we can take throughout the hospital. Um, I have a surgery suite. Uh, and everything is sterile, just like a regular animal hospital. Um, and then we have a variety of incubator sizes and types uh, for our patients that we get. Uh, and we have an in-house diagnostic lab. We run samples of blood, uh, stool samples, look at, you know, you name it, we look. <laughs> um, and then we have a variety of treatment rooms that are inside of the hospital that are like little wards. So we have our songbird ward, our raptor ward, our mammal ward. Um, our, our herps tend to share some space. Uh, they go wherever it's most convenient to put them because we get smaller numbers of them, but, um, but we, we make space for them always. Um, and then we have um, about uh, 10 acres on the hospital side uh, the, where we have a variety of pre-release enclosures. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the rehabilitation process as well. And something that's kind of important to highlight is that a lot of small nonprofit wildlife centers do not have the capabilities that we do. We're very, very fortunate to be funded by a lot of grants and, and generous donors um, that have made it possible to hire a full time veterinarian, mm -hmm. which is also pretty rare for a lot of smaller wildlife mm -hmm. centers and all of these really, really important diagnostic and treatment uh, equipment. Um, so we're essentially equipped like a general animal hospital that you would find, you know, where you bring your dogs and cats, and we have all those specialized equipment now for the wildlife, which is really, really useful. Mm -hmm. Do we have any relevant questions to this kind of yeah, it looks like a intro? A little bit. Nothing yet? Nothing okay. at this time. Okay. Um, so where are we right now as of today? Uh, we have had about 291 animals admitted so far since January. Um, it's kicked up a lot in the last two months. Um, this includes uh, over 200 birds, 86 mammals, uh, three reptiles. Um, and the vast majority of what we do uh, during this part of the season are songbirds. We'll talk a little bit about um, patient prevalence and, and who comes. Uh, so our most common patients that we have um, here are rock squirrels, house finches, desert cottontails, ravens, and then striped skunks. Uh, we're in the middle of skunk baby season too, so well, yeah. a stinky, exciting, cute time. We have 19 baby skunks yeah. in our hospital right now, so <laughs> um, some of them are outside already. <laughs> a little stinky. But, yeah, we, we see a, a variety. So, and then um, here's what happens throughout the year for us. So um, during the winter time, things slow down a little bit with the quantity of patients. Um, and then in the late uh, late spring to early fall, things really spike. Um, and the reason is because that is baby season. 
um, which we're in right now. So that's why, why we're here still at the hospital. Um, instead of hanging out, um, drinking margaritas while we do this. <laughs> so um, this is when we also get a really high volume of calls. And it sounds like uh, Game and Fish also gets a high volume of calls um, about what the heck are these animals doing outside my window? Or, you know, we were driving past here and we saw this. So uh, that's because of baby season. And we'll talk all about baby season in a little bit because that is very, very relevant right now. Yeah. Um, so why do they come? Um, the main, the most common reason for presentation is orphan animals. So something happened to the mother um, or the parents in general. Um, and then we are coming in. Um, and then the other really common reasons are a cat interaction. So um, we've got a lot of trouble with uh, outdoor cats, particularly in the city, grabbing birds and small animals. Um, sometimes surprisingly large animals. Uh, and then also window and wall collisions and then uh, various other human interventions and, and just strange things, hit by cars, all, all of that, we see it. Hey, Jessica. Um, yeah. We did have a question that come, came in and it's kind of relevant to your last graph that you had up um, yeah. before the baby one. Um, it showed the bar graph of the numbers of animals that you guys see. Um, so Steph, uh, Steph was asking if those numbers uh, change, um, because are they higher than you normally would see just because of the wildfires that are going on? Not right now. Um, we are getting a lot more calls about the wildfires um, and what's happening. Um, but I think that what happened was with the fires, the people evacuated, like thankfully they're safe, um, uh, prior to the fire coming close enough that there was disturbance of the wildlife. Um, and so we got, um, we heard some things from some of the conservation officers that were still in the area, but very little about um, the public bringing animals to us. So we're fielding a lot of calls, but our numbers aren't up specifically from the fires at this point. Um, we're really curious what's going to happen with fawn season um, as the um, food availability changes and as the does are stressed, what's going to happen and if our uh, fawn numbers are going to go up. So and now is when we usually start seeing them. So we're starting to get calls. We don't have any fawn patients right now, but we're expecting that to happen soon. Great. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Um, we're just going to go through a few fun cases because we felt like it uh, explains a little bit about what we do um, in a more interactive story way. Um, so these are our bobcats that came in last year. Um, we had three that came in during the regular season. Uh, so starting around now. Um, two were healthy orphans. One orphan had a leg injury. It had a bite into its wrist from some other animal that we had to manage. Um, these patients spend a long time with us. We overwinter them. Um, they start on formula. Um, and then when they get a little bigger, they get to go outside um, and they are in the enclosure for a long time. Um, we have to make sure that they are able to hunt and fend for themselves um, before they are releasable. Um, and these ones did great, including the one that had the leg injury. Um, so it was exciting to watch them grow. Um, always hard to stay away from them so that they don't think we're friends. Um, but thankfully, the bobcats tend to stay wild um, and want to eat you just a little bit. Um, <laughs> as you can see in the, the picture that will come through as we have as we change our subjects. Um, so I think if we push the next video, uh, we'll see their release, hopefully. released um, in April um, after they've been overwintered and uh, we do coordinate our releases with Game and Fish to make sure um, it's a good area, the biologist sort of knows what's going on, where, um, and we're able to coordinate that. Um, another patient to highlight is a red-tailed hawk. Uh, it was sort of a rare case. It came in looking like this. Um, all of the feathers were singed really severely um, to the point that he was totally unable to fly. Uh, we talked to some folks and they think maybe this bird flew through a methane flare um, enough to cause severe damage to the feathers, but not so much that um, it caused severe damage to the lungs. 
Um, this bird spent 564 days with us. Uh, he went through a molt um, and we saw that the feathers were going out, growing out well. Um, they do not always molt all of their feathers each year. Um, and that was the case for this bird. So what we were able to do um, is assist with the rest of the molt by imping, uh, which is a process wherein we use donor feathers from a, um, a red tail hawk of the appropriate size. Um, and we attach them in to a uh, remnant piece of um, the feather from this bird. So um, it's just, adding in a new feather that will work when the, when she does go ahead and molt those feathers, um, that imped feather will fall out like normal and she'll have a healthy feather come out afterwards. And oftentimes we'll use um, molted feathers from our ambassador animals mm -hmm. for this process. So our ambassador animals go through a molt every single year. And so we've got two red tailed hawks here that then, you know, molt their feathers every year and we can use those for imping processes yeah. like this. So we've been growing our feather library. Yeah, so that we can do this. Well, this one was a great one because she was finally released after spending over 560 days in our care. So that was a really exciting one for all of us with the amount of resources and time that was put into her. We'll try to send you the videos later. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's a fun one. Uh, this little baby rock squirrel came in uh, with a spiral fracture to her right humerus. Uh, and she also had some blood and some fleas. So uh, there had been some trauma and probably she was orphaned based on her size. Um, we pinned that bone and it resolved uh, when they're juvenile animals, frequently they heal really quickly. She just had a pin in there for a week um, and then she recovered. Uh, then she broke a tooth and she spent even longer <laughs> with us, got a little chunky, like you might be able to tell in the x-ray, she's got a lot of little neck fat on there. Um, so then uh, after her tooth issue resolved, um, she went through a little weight loss journey with us uh, and got some exercise outside and then she was released. So uh, we don't always get to do advanced medicine on red squirrels, but we did this time. <laughs> Um, here's a bull snake patient that came in, uh, last summer because, uh, he was weed whacked. The lady was, was working on her garden and all of a sudden here comes the snake. Um, so, uh, this guy had a lot of lacerations and superficial wounds and was really dehydrated, which happens frequently when there's been wounds. Um, and so we rehydrated, we did a lot of different wound care, some, um, creative bandaging <laughs> and it's just <laughs> animals, the tube. Um, and after about a month and a half, uh, he was ready to go and he got released. And there's another video that probably won't show up. I don't think we actually oh, were able to put that there one in go. there. So, <laughs> um, and then just a little bit more about the rehabilitation process. So what the heck happens here? So the first thing is the initial exam, um, what we diagnose and then coming up with the treatment plan. So when an animal comes in, they get a full physical exam. This is a picture of me um, examining a raven with one of our interns. Based on that initial assessment, uh, we decide what to do. So it's a triage process, essentially. Um, unfortunately, a large number of animals that come into our care um, are there because something terrible has happened. Um, and there are uh, ethical reasons why we decide, you know, if this animal is not going to be able to be recovered and released into the wild, um, in most cases, we do elect to humanely euthanize them uh, because we wouldn't want them to live with a terrible injury. Um, and in some cases, it would be too much to ask them to go through um, a care, go through some medical treatment that the prognosis is not great that they'll recover. Um, so we really have to sort of decide, you know, is it ethical to put this animal through care if the prognosis is really bad? Um, sometimes we, you know, look at the animal and there's only one problem, it's a terrible problem. Maybe we can try some Hail Mary treatments um, and go ahead and go do it. So I don't want, I don't want it to sound like we're, we don't, uh, we don't try things out um, and give every patient the best shot, but um, frequently human euthanasia is the appropriate thing to do.
Um, a lot of patients, uh, like we mentioned, almost half of them come in because they're orphans. So they get um, intensive rehabilitation care from our rehabilitators. Um, so that means feeding them sometimes 30 minute, every 30 minute intervals, uh, sometimes even more frequently. Um, and then we um, take care of all their body systems. So make sure they're hydrated, make sure they're not in pain treat any infection, um, and then do additional diagnostics if necessary. So, you know, is this a fracture? How bad is it? Where is it? What can we do? Um, all of those things. Um, then once we've determined what to do, uh, we continue on with it. So making sure that they're, uh, they're comfortable as possible throughout the whole process, um, making sure that their infections are controlled. Uh, taking care of their wounds or fractures. Sometimes we do this with uh, just bandaging. So this bird has what's called a figure eight bandage on it. Um, and then there's some big old ugly pieces of tape there we call distraction tabs. So when he decides to try to remove his bandage himself because he's a helpful little prairie falcon, uh, we <laughs> limit that by him just uh, attacking the tape instead of his bandage. <laughs> um, there are other cases where we do surgical management of both wounds and fractures. Uh, we had a coach whip come in today that had a really bad wound um, and he had a surgical repair of that wound. Um, and then there are um, patients that require other care. So a lot of the orphans come in hypothermic and so they go right into an incubator um, to get warmed up. We have other cases where patients come in like they got caught in the rain at the wrong time with the wrong place and got hit by a car. We had a vulture that came in last week like that. So that whole adult vulture went into an incubator. Um, thankfully, thanks to some grants, we've got a nice size incubator that he could actually fit in. Um, we have a variety of cages that we can put oxygen in uh, with our oxygen concentrators. Um, sometimes that's an incubator where there's warmth and humidity. Sometimes it's just a regular crate where they can be safe and calm. Uh, we have to make sure that their uh, humidity is taken care of. So uh, where they are in the state and what kind of animal they are will depend on how much humidity they need. And usually it's the babies that need that. Um, and then a lot of our day is taken up by feeding animals. So uh, feeding baby birds um, or uh, syringe feeding or bottle nursing a variety of other mammals. Um, when the fawns come in, they get fed initially by hand with a bottle and then we move them on to bottle racks. Um, and then all of this, uh, the frequency, the method, how much they're eating each time, all of that is species and age dependent. And a lot of that has to do with the uh, specialty knowledge that our rehabilitators have um, in dealing with all these individual species. Um, so after they've been taken care of, um, they go through pre-release. So we need to make sure that they're reconditioned. Uh, so a lot of the animals get physical therapy, make sure that their range of motion is good, uh, make sure that their uh, muscle development is symmetrical um, and everything's good to go. Um, we have our inside of our hospital, we call our ICU. And then once their sort of initial issues are resolved, then they start going into a variety of different outdoor caging um, that has graduated the sizing. So the first uh, cage that a raptor might go in or enclosure um, is usually like 10 feet. So they're just, you know, getting comfortable again, preening in the sunshine, um, eating outside, having access to everything they need. Um, and then they start going up, up and top. Uh, larger and larger enclosures, depending on how much size they need uh, for their species. So like we, you know, our red tail hawks and our golden eagles, they always go through the hundred foot enclosure before release. Uh, but you know, our screech owls don't need a hundred feet. <laughs> they're fine. They're fine in the 25 foot um, prior to release. So um, a lot of that just like making sure they're good to go because once they're outside, um, they are on their own. So they need to be fully functioning. Um, the juveniles need to be able to feed and forage on their own. Uh, we do put a lot of them through something we call mouse school where they learn how to hunt live prey. Um, most of this is innate. It's not like we're out there doing hunter education courses <laughs> uh, with, uh, 
with the baby animals, but, uh, but we want to make sure that they can do that and they can do it successfully and dependent on the species um, and why they came in. So if they're juvenile or if they've had an eye injury, they usually go through a more uh, serious mouse school than if it's a bird that's an adult bird, it's been doing great on its own, just had some terrible injury happen. It's been with us for a few months. We just want to make sure that they can catch at least one mouse and then we can kick them out. Um, so all that varies dependent on the individual. Um, so right before release, we have to make sure that they can survive on its own. And um, as rehabilitators, there's a couple uh, very specific things that we need to make sure. So are they in peak physical condition? Are they able to hunt and forage? And are they able to interact with their own species? Uh, a lot of that comes into play with animals that are um, at risk of becoming habituated. We do not want our animals to go seek out food or shelter from humans. We want them to live their normal natural history out in the world. Um, and so we need to make sure that, you know, they know that they're, um, you know, uh, you are a red tail hawk or, you know, you are a fawn and live that life. So that's really important. Um, and where we release them um, depends, like I said, with the bobcats, we usually work with Game and Fish to coordinate that. Um, most frequently, they're going to a suitable habitat near their rescue location. And, and truly with most animals, it's within a couple miles. Um, for some of them, they have a range and we want to put them back in that range if they haven't been out of it for too long. Um, you know, they fought for that spot and we want to make sure that they keep it. Um, we do make sure that they're away from major roads and busy areas, um, and they need a water and a food source nearby. So, um, Jess and Sarah, a question came across of what happens to the animals that are not able to progress to be released? Um, so we try to catch that early um, and determine if that's likely during the triage stage. Um, if we don't think it's likely that they'll be released and they have um, something bad that's happened, which is why we think that they wouldn't be released, um, then normally we're euthanizing those animals uh, because we would not want them to go through a painful life. Um, there is a small number of animals um, who, when they come in through our hospital, whatever is wrong with them is not something that's going to be painful or lead to a harmful life. Um, and occasionally those animals come up as options to be education ambassadors, essentially. So um, our ambassador animal collection is mostly made up of animals that were non-releasable wildlife. Um, and so if we think that the animal, uh, particularly they're usually young animals when it's like, oh, well, maybe this would be a case where uh, this animal can teach the masses essentially and be a great ambassador for its species and for wildlife in New Mexico, um, then some of those animals uh, do become candidates for that. Um, and there's also some specific rules we have to follow. So uh, for example, for the eagles, there's a lot of federal rules for that. Uh, we currently have a non-releasable golden eagle um, and he's probably going to go live in a zoo somewhere. Um, he doesn't have a painful process. He just doesn't know that he's an eagle. Um, and that <laughs> happened before he came to us. <laughs> so um, when those things happen, uh, then we do try to do whatever is best for the animal. Great. Great, thank you. Yeah, of course. That, that's a question we get commonly. So I'm mm -hmm. glad that somebody asked that. Um, you guys so, happen to find that there is a particular type of animal that makes a better ambassador, like a red tail hawk or something like that, that you can actually kind of train and, you know, be, be mindful when you're actually trying to show it to a bunch of kids or, or a group of people? Absolutely. So we definitely take that into account. There are some species of animals that just, in general, they're, they're, disposition is just not one that would make them suitable for education. Um, one that we often talk about are Cooper's hawks. Cooper's mm -hmm. hawks are a very, very, very high stress animal in general. They're very hard to rehabilitate because they just want to murder themselves in their enclosure. They want to bash themselves. They rip their bandages off. They refuse treatment. Um, and so they're hard to rehabilitate and they are not good candidates for education. Um, same with most of those excipiter type raptors, the kind of sharp shinned hawks and, um, and goshawks as well. They're very high uh, stress uh, raptor species. And also we look at the temperament of the animal. So if we see an animal that is already incredi incredibly aggressive, um, just in a small period of time in rehab, 
they've shown that they're incredibly terrified of people and very high stress, then that tells us they're not going to be a good candidate for education. Um, some of the best education um, animals are those that come in as human imprints. Um, so we currently have a female American kestrel named Amelia who came to our wildlife hospital and had clearly been raised by people in the wild. Um, from day one, we knew she was a human imprint. And we immediately decided that we would love to have her on our uh, ambassador animal team. Um, so we went through the permits pretty quickly and got her onboarded. And so she's been trained kind of from day one for education and she is phenomenal. She's not really terrified about much. Nothing really phases her. Children screaming, cameras in her faces. She's very, very unfazed by that. So we definitely take that into consideration very, very closely, the species and the temperament of the animal. Yeah, but it, it's a, it's a hard game to play sometimes because mm -hmm. uh, just because they've been imprinted doesn't mean that they're going to be happy around people. Yeah. Um, and so we try to do a lot of education of like, please leave these baby animals mm -hmm. to be babies with their families. Um, so uh, yeah, just trying to strike that balance. I'm mm -hmm. like, yes, Amelia, she's perfect and we love her. Um, but also <laughs> like, please don't do this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. She's a physically healthy animal who would have been able to survive in the wild if she had not been raised by people. Yeah. Um, and she is pretty underdeveloped for her, her, uh, she's, she's smaller than she should be because she was not fed the correct thing. So there's definitely some indications that she was not properly cared for, um, before she came to us. Um, speaking of babies, <laughs> Uh, babies. what we've got going on. So we do have um, some nestling and uh, sort of a fledgling red tail hawk right now, um, in addition to some adults in the hospital. Um, and then we've got a couple of great horned owls. They've been progressing their uh, life stages are ridiculous uh, from when they are nestlings and then they start going, you know, through their branch or fledgling stages and they just like have all different kinds of uh, changes that we are monitoring while they're doing that. Um, we always get a lot of corvids, so ravens and crows. We also get a lot of jays, um, and then a wide variety of songbirds, uh, lots of finches, um, and we have a lot of other like insectivorous species. We've got a barn swallow right now that's been growing up. Um, and then we have a variety of small mammals. We've got some rock squirrels, um, an antelope squirrel. Uh, and then we've had a few groups of chipmunks already go through and grow up and be released. Um, and then we always get a variety of rabbits. Most frequently we get the desert cottontails up here, um, but we have had other admits like jackrabbits. Um, and then we have skunks, lots of skunks. And then uh, right now we've got three golden eagles in care. One is trying to decide if his feathers are going to continue to come in appropriately or be silly. Uh, one is an imprint. Um, and so he's probably going to go live in a zoo. And then we have a new one uh, who has some lead toxicity and some just sort of uh, musculoskeletal trauma uh, that we've been treating for him. Uh, and then uh, we've got some ravens. We have a raven with um, a metacarpal fracture uh, that was uh, had an external fixator applied to it. And he's been doing well. Um, and then some adult finches. Uh, we had a morning dove that got squished um, in the road a little bit, just sort of like just a little tap, but it caused a lot of uh, trauma. But he He's outside flying and, and reconditioning now. Uh, we have a bat right now uh, and a box turtle that uh, sort of a common presentation had some paint on them. Uh, we really discourage people from painting turtles uh, because it is putting it on their bone um, and it makes them more susceptible to predation. Um, and it's also just bad because they uh, absorb all the toxins from that paint. And could you ladies also clarify um, to the group what a fledgling is, just so they know that life cycle of the stage of that bird? Yeah, we're going to talk about that during our baby season portion. So I'll kind of hold off and I'm going to go into detail about kind of the different life stages of birds and when and when you shouldn't intervene with them. Um, so we'll talk a lot about that in a second. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then just a little background on uh, how we are doing this and managing it. So um, we're not an island on our own. Uh, we're working with uh, these federal and state organizations um, to make sure that all of our ideals are aligning. Um, so our federal permits are through U.S. Fish and Wildlife and our state permits are through Game and Fish. 
Uh, we're not currently allowed to admit uh, raccoons and foxes and bobcats. Uh, our raccoon calls seem to increase every year um, with, you know, what do we do? We trapped out this mother raccoon and now we have kids left over. Um, but we do not currently uh, rehabilitate them on the premises or at all. Whoa. <laughs> and then uh, we're required to report any endangered, threatened, or protected species. Um, most of them to both a federal and state, uh, just to make sure everybody knows who is where. Um, when we get these specialty species in, uh, we want to make sure that they, you know, you all know, um, hey, this animal was here and this happened to it. And that can be important for uh, larger population reasons. Um, a lot of what we do can sort of filter up the chain um, and just sort of spread awareness of what's happening. Another thing that I realized I forgot to put on here is that we report any um, major die-offs that we see mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I think it was a couple years ago that there was the mass die-off of songbirds mm -hmm. in this area. Um, and so we worked with the Wildlife Health Laboratory. Uh, we worked with Game and Fish and they sent uh, samples up to the USGS uh, Wildlife Health Lab uh, to contribute to that science and figure out what the heck happened kind of thing. So uh, we try to participate as much as we can in that. A lot of people on staff, probably most of all, uh, Jessica and myself, uh, are very interested in research and want to be part of it. Um, and there's lots of examples of uh, wildlife rehabilitation serving as a sentinel for disease and population changes in general. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're participating in all of that. Okay, any questions about our wildlife hospital or kind of how we operate? We're going to shift gears a little bit more towards um, education on, on New Mexico's wildlife and how you can help them. I think you're good to proceed. Perfect. So a lot of you are wildlife people, and so you probably already know a lot of what I'm about to say, but uh, New Mexico is fourth in biodiversity in the country, um, primarily because of the fact that we have a huge diversity of habitats all throughout New Mexico. Our ecosystems are so diverse that it helps to facilitate the, um, the life of different types of animals. So, you know, the animals that are found in the southern part of the state, the really deserty area compared to the foresty area of the northern part of the state are gonna be really, really different. Um, and another thing I'm gonna talk about in a second is that we're, a, we're part of a migratory pathway. Um, so we get a lot of unique animals that travel just through New Mexico um, during that migration season. So we are incredibly diverse and very fortunate to have such an awesome group of animals just living in our state. Um, I want to talk about some of the most common animals that you're going to see around. Again, a lot of you probably already know this, but um, there are some common New Mexico mammals that you'll see kind of all around the state, even in kind of urban areas. Um, we have bobcats and coyotes. I've seen quite a few of those around here. Raccoons, bears, uh, squirrels and chipmunks everywhere, cottontails and skunks. So those are some of the really common mammals that you'll kind of see no matter where you are in New Mexico. Um, New Mexico birds, so I'm a bird person, so I absolutely love all of the diverse birds that we have here. Um, we do have some really common raptor species that you'll see around, so red-tailed hawks. Cooper's hawks really like urban areas. That is the most common species of raptor I see in Santa Fe, and likely what people see in Albuquerque as well. They love to hang out around people's bird feeders um, because that is where their favorite food lives, songbirds. Uh, Swainson's hawks are another common species. I just visited the southern part of the state and wow, there are a ton of Swainson's hawks down there. They love nesting down there. Um, crows and ravens are probably the most common larger bird species you're going to see around. We have some ravens that nest right near our property and we see their family flying around every single year. Lots of different songbirds and that changes based off the season. We are, like I said, in a migratory pathway. So during the migration season, we're going to see some really unique, strange songbirds passing through. We have golden and bald eagles here. The bald eagles are going to be found primarily in areas with water. Um, so in the northern part of the state, you can find them near uh, Abiquiu Lake, um, as well as some osprey. And then waterfowl. So any kind of uh, excuse me, ducks and geese. Um, obviously there's the Bosque, which is one of the most magnificent places to see waterfowl. Um, and then also just kind of sprinkled throughout New Mexico and different other water areas. 
And then I want to highlight turkey vultures because I love turkey vultures and they are all over New Mexico. Um, they're the most common uh, species of raptor that we see in New Mexico. Every time I drive somewhere, I always see them flying around. Um, and that's because they rely on dead things and dead things are everywhere. Um, so they're pretty spread out everywhere through New Mexico. Um, and they're really, really important to our ecosystems. They kind of get a bad rap and they're oftentimes portrayed as villains in Disney movies, but uh, we love them. They are very, very important. This is a picture of Soul, our ambassador turkey vulture, who is has my whole heart um and y'all should come visit him here because he is magnificent and will make everyone a turkey vulture lover <laughs> and then some reptiles so obviously new mexico is packed full of reptiles but just some highlights um bull snakes are going to be one of the most common snakes you'll find in new mexico especially in urban areas they're all over santa fe albuquerque they're all over our property here we yeah. see them everywhere same with coach whips. We always have coach whips uh, popping up around our property here. Um, they also are a climbing snake. Um, and so they will oftentimes climb trees to get into nests. Um, so they're very active this time of year, um, invading bird nests. Garter snakes, another really common snake that is found kind of all over New Mexico. And lots of little lizards, primarily whip tails and fence lizards are those common ones you'll see. Um, horned lizards are absolutely fantastic, um, and you'll find them in certain parts of New Mexico. Rattlesnakes, we do have a few rattlesnake species um, here in New Mexico. Um, and as I always like to say, they are uh, not going to hurt you unless you invade their space. Um, so we always like to teach kids that that rattle noise that you hear is not them telling you that they're going to bite you. It's them telling you that they are present and that they don't want to bite you and that you should step back. Um, and so they do get a bad rap, but they're very important for our ecosystems. Um, and so we do a lot here at New Mexico Wildlife Center trying to promote understanding of rattlesnakes and how to kind of coexist with them. And then box turtles, one of the more common turtle species. We have two ambassador box turtles here, um, and we do get them into our hospital quite a bit. Any questions about those lists? None so far. And as I said, things kind of change a little bit uh, with the seasons, depending on what animals you're going to see. Uh, so starting with fall, uh, during fall, we see fall migration. So birds are going to be flying south for the winter. And that's what I was saying about seeing those kind of unique birds that might not oftentimes live here, but will just pass right through. And we get those into our hospital during fall. We'll get occasional very rare species. We got a black swift a little while while ago, and that was very unique. Um, so it's kind of fun seeing those, those strange animals that come through during the migration. That means you also might find a lot more animals that are um, undernourished or um, dehydrated um, because migration takes a lot of resources. And so oftentimes you might find them not able to find those resources. And that's when you can bring them to a wildlife rehabilitator like us. And in the fall, we're gonna see a lot of animals learning how to survive in their first year. So this is right after baby season. The babies are no longer babies. The parents have kicked them out. They said, you gotta figure this out on your own. And sometimes that they're not so great at that. And I have a picture of Cinder, our red-tailed hawk here, because red-tailed hawks um, are one of the more common species we see coming into our wildlife hospital in the fall as first year red-tailed hawks, not quite figuring out how to be a red-tailed hawk yet. And so Cinder is one that was hit by a car within her first year. Another very common reason why red tails get brought in in their first year is they're hit by cars. Um, and red tailed hawks actually have a mortality rate of over 70% within their first year. Um, and so they have a very, very low survival rate. And that's pretty common for a lot of raptor species. So in the fall, you're gonna be seeing those birds migrating and also that those first year animals possibly not quite figuring out how to survive and might need some help. Now, moving on to winter, um, that's when things kind of slow down. We see hibernation, brumation, and dormancy. So a lot of animals are going to go into their dens or nice warm places where they can kind of sleep and, and try and uh, limit the number of resources they're using. Um, and unfortunately, during the winter, we see a large increase in the number of severe cases that are admitted to our hospital. So animals that come in severely sick, severely malnourished and thin, 
or some severe injuries. And that's just because in the winter, there's not a lot of resources. So that the food is not abundant. There's not a lot of water present. Um, and the drop in temperature makes it really hard for them to regulate their temperatures. Um, so we see a lot of patients that come in. Um, and unfortunately, that's when our release rate does drop is during the winter because we get a lot of severe cases in that either die within the first 24 hours or we do have to end up deciding for human euthanasia on those cases. And so we always tell people to keep an eye out in the winter um, for animals that are very, very obviously not doing well. Um, and the sooner you can bring them to our hospital, the more likely we're able to kind of get them to bounce back. And I have a picture of a sandhill crane here because this is one of the patients we got in a couple winters ago. Um, and it had actually been illegally shot um, outside of hunting season and had a severe wing um, injury because of it. And so he was in our hospital for a while um, getting treated. And so another situation where um, it's a pretty severe injury um, that comes into our hospital during the winter. Spring, we like spring. It's a crazy busy season, but we love it. Um, that is when all of the birds that migrated south are coming back. They're establishing their territories. They're finding mates, they're building nests and they're getting ready to have babies. So breeding season starts. We start to see our very first babies coming in in April, um, but that's usually the early start of the season. Um, and that's oftentimes when you'll start seeing animals wake up from that hibernation and brumation. Um, oftentimes we will overwinter snakes in our hospital. Um, so if we get a snake that comes in that has been caught by a cat, we treat it and then we wait until spring to release it because they're just not going to have a good chance of survival if we put them out in the freezing cold. Um, so spring is also when all of our reptile patients are gone after spending uh, the winter with us. And then summer is a continuation of that breeding season. So breeding season will be in its peak form in June, July, and early August. Um, and again, by the end, you're going to see a lot of first year wild animals learning to survive. This is a picture of a great horned owl uh, fledgling that unfortunately suffered from a beak fracture. You can see that his beak completely broke off. We're not quite sure how that happened. He was just found that way. Um, but just an example of when they're clumsy, sometimes that means that some severe injuries can happen. Um, and so we're really fortunate to be able to take these babies who had one little slip up suffered a severe injury and be able to fix them up so they have another chance of survival back in the wild. Baby season. I want to talk a lot about baby season right now because that is what we're in. We're getting a lot of calls. Game and Fish is getting a lot of calls. So talking about kind of what do babies look like, the different phases of, of the babies go through and when you should intervene. Because a lot of times Babies are doing okay and we should not uh, interrupt their process, but there are some times when we should. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about baby birds first because that's a really common one that we see. Birds are all over urban areas. You know, you have house finches nesting in your yards all the time. So they're just everywhere. So that's the most common call we get is I have found a bird that fell out of the nest. What do I do? <clears throat> and so there's, uh, we have this flow chart over here and all these flow charts that I'm about to show you are on our website. So you can always hop onto our website if you find something and kind of go through this flow chart. But the first thing you want to do is kind of determine whether this baby bird needs intervention. So nestlings are little tiny naked baby birds. And you can see the far left picture. Um, those are nestlings. Those are very, very, very young nestlings. Their eyes are still closed. They're very naked. Um, and raptors uh, go through this as well. So if you find raptors in their nestlings, they start out as naked and then they get this downy feather. So it's just this kind of fluffy white feather. So that's when they're nestlings. And when they're nestlings, they're not able to thermoregulate very well. So they do need their parents to help with thermoregulation. And um, surviving on the ground is just not a good option for them. So we always recommend if you find a nestling on the ground to try to put it back in the nest. If you can find the nest, if you can reach the nest, put it back in the nest. Um, something that I'm going to talk a lot about is, is when to bring it to us, when to not. We always, we always say that we want to keep them with the parents as much as possible. The wild parents are going to be better at raising these babies than we are most of the time. Um, and so we'll do everything in our power to try and reunite babies with their parents before they're brought to us. Um, so with nestlings, we always try to get them back into the nest. 
You can also make a makeshift nest if you can't reach the nest. You can make kind of a box strung up and string it up into a tree near where the nest is. And oftentimes the mom will still come and take care of um, that baby. We do recommend that you keep an eye on that baby in the nest to make sure that the parents do come back. Um, sometimes a, you know, parents have been killed by a cat or suffered from some other kind of injury and are not able to get back to their babies. And that's when you should definitely bring the nestlings to our center. If you know the parents are no longer there and no longer taking care of the babies, that's when you should bring them to a wildlife rehabilitator. Or if you see that the nestling has been injured, um, if you see that it has obvious puncture wounds or any kind of wound on it, then it also needs to get treatment as well. Fledglings, on the other hand, are baby birds that are very, very, very close to being gone from the nest, very close to being uh, independent. And oftentimes those birds will look almost like adult birds. They have most of those adult feathers. They're mostly adult size. They might still have some fluff. Their wing feathers and tail feathers might be a little bit short, but this is a natural process that fledglings go through is hopping out of the nest and learning how to fly. And so what we oftentimes get calls about is people calling us and saying, there's a bird, it's hopping on the ground in my yard. And generally, if it's hopping really, really well around the ground, it's probably a fledgling who decided it wanted to take its first flight, didn't, wasn't quite prepared for the first flight, and ended up on the ground. And so our preference when it comes to fledglings is leave them be. The parents are still there. The parents are still taking care of them. The parents are still going to be coming down to the ground and taking care of those fledglings. Um, the only time we will intervene is if it's in a very dangerous location. So if it's in a very, very high traffic location, in a yard with dogs, anything that we know that this, this fledgling does not have a good chance, then we'll intervene. Um, but generally, we like to leave them with their parents. And that brings us to cat attack victims, which are kind of a different case altogether. If we have an, any kind of bird that has been found on the ground in the mouth of a cat, or you suspect has been caught by a cat, that needs to go to a wildlife rehabilitator immediately. Even if you don't see any wounds on it, um, cats have very tiny teeth that make very, very tiny punctures and their mouths are so full of dangerous bacteria that the risk of infection is really, really high. So anytime we get in any animals that we know have been in the mouth of a cat, they're immediately put on antibiotics as a preventative just to make sure that they don't get any infection. So in summary, nestlings, little naked babies, we want them to go back in the nest with their parents. If that's not possible, make a little makeshift nest. And if you know that the parents are no longer taking care of them, then you can call a wildlife rehabilitator. Fledglings, close to being adults, little fluffy, not quite there, hopping around on the ground, leave them be unless they're in imminent danger. Another thing you can do to help baby birds is not trim trees during the season. There's a lot of really well hidden nests that are up in trees. Um, and so we will be bought birds from uh, ranches that have been cut down. Um, so that's one way you can just help kind of keep everyone happy during the breeding season is just don't trim your trees. Wait until after August to trim those trees. And I do want to highlight that every single bird uh, has a very specialized diet. Um, and our wildlife rehabilitators create these magical little concoctions for each species um, that is specific to what their, the makeup of what they would be getting in the wild is. So we know if a bird is going to be insectivorous or uh, granivorous or anything like that, we can make that diet specific for it. Um, we get a lot of people who find baby birds and try to take care of them by themselves using goat milk or crushed up cat food. Um, and oftentimes that can cause more harm than good. Um, and I'll kind of talk in a little bit about what you should do if you do find a baby bird, how to kind of take care of it and get it to a center. Um, but I just want to preface with that, that with baby birds, they're very delicate um, and it's best to get them to a, a center as fast as possible if they need to go there. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think that that's beautiful. Great. <laughs> <laughs> baby mammals. Um, so <laughs> mammals here uh, are not as, uh, let's see, they're not helicopter parents. Let's just say that. Uh, most mammal parents are going to spend a lot of time away from their babies. 
Um, so we get a lot of calls about rabbits and fawns and rabbits are one that the parents really do not uh, spend much time with the babies. They're often times off foraging and doing their own thing and they'll check in on the babies and feed them you know twice a day and so if you find some baby rabbits and you don't see a parent nearby there's no need to be concerned about that the parent is likely just off doing something and is going to come back soon um and while uh some tiny baby rabbits do need to be uh, brought to a wildlife center even if they're a pretty small size the size of a softball they're independent at that point so we do get people who bring us uh, cottontails that are, you know, about this big and say that they found them hopping around their yard. And we always tell them to go put it back. Um, it's just it's just figuring itself out. It's new. It's new to the world, um, but it's independent. So it's no longer relying on its parent and it's off on its own. Um, so generally, our recommendations with rabbits is leave it alone unless you know the parent has been killed or most uh, cottontail, uh, cottontails that we get into our hospital have been caught by cats. Um, a lot of time cats will go uh, foraging in a little cottontail den, find a baby, bring it inside, and that's when we end up with it. Um, I'll just add the um, size is sometimes like shockingly small to people. Um, my husband works up in Los Alamos and we get a fair number of rabbit patients from Los Alamos. So I usually send them with him to release. Um, and every time he's like, are you sure? But are you sure you're sure? It's, it's a baby. And I'm like, no, I'm certain. His ears are up. His eyes are open. He's bigger than a softball. Calm down. Open the cage. Let it out. Um, so um, it is like, it's not uh, what we're sort of programmed to think of as an animal that's ready to be independent on its own. But for sure, they're ready. And uh, baby mammals. I see there's a lot of uh, things popping up in the chat, but I maybe I'll finish baby mammals and then we'll answer some questions based off of this because I'm sure there's a lot. Um, so fawns, another really common um, species we get calls about. And that's another one that the parents leave for a very extended period of time. Um, so they'll say, hey, I found this fawn. It's just laying here on the ground. Uh, should I bring it in? And we say, no, hold off, wait a few hours, see if you see the mother come back. And oftentimes I'll call back and say, hey, the mom came back. Um, so we always recommend if you see a fawn, um, if it's in a place where you can watch it, step back way, way back um, and keep an eye on it and see if you see the parents come back within a few hours. Um, a reminder that if the parents do see you, they probably won't come back because they don't want to show you where their baby is. Um, so you have to be pretty well hidden if you're going to be spying on a baby fawn. Um, and fawns are another one that we will do everything in our power to keep them with their parents um, instead of bringing them to us if it's possible. Fawns are really, really delicate and have a relatively low success rate in rehabilitation. Um, and we know that they're always going to have a better chance if they're with their natural parents. So anytime we can, we try to keep them with their parents unless it's absolutely necessary. We got a couple last year that it was very obvious the parent had either been killed or it had somehow just been abandoned. And so we were able to take those two fawns in. Anything to add? Um, just briefly particularly talking about uh, uh, deer and elk, because we do have some hotspots in the state with chronic wasting mm. disease. Uh, there are some particular rules that we follow uh, to try to limit disease spread. Uh, so we only rehabilitate fawns that are found north of I-40 um, at our facility so that we can sort of group everybody together uh, that's in sort of a safe zone. So we don't have any issues with disease spread. Um, do we want to answer? I think I have one more. Yeah, I have one more about uh, specifics of mammals, and then we can answer some questions. Um, so I just want to touch on some other ones. Those are really the most common ones we get calls about. Well, we do get calls about raccoons, squirrels, and skunks a lot, and they're primarily calls about finding them in their house. There's a raccoon in my house. I can tell it had babies. What do I do? I want it gone. Um, our advice to people is always close up the holes to your house before breeding season starts. Once they're in there, they're in there. And it's gonna be very difficult to get rid of them. There's a few things you can do to try to naturally get them out, but your best bet at preventing raccoons, squirrels, and skunks from, from using your home as a nesting site is to close up any holes to your attic or any basement or anything like that. Um, we always tell people not to close up the hole after they find the babies. 
If there's babies in your home and you close up that hole, that mom is going to be incredibly stressed about the fact that she can't get to her babies and you're going to have some dead babies on your hands as well. So we always tell people close up that hole before baby season. There are a few things you can do to try and naturally deter them. You can get a rag soaked in ammonia and kind of put it near that area to try and get them out. Unfortunately, if a mama has babies, she's not really going to be very interested in leaving a nice, warm, cozy space. Um, Bobcats and coyotes, another two uh, that we get calls about, and our calls are kind of increasing as they're becoming more urban. Um, bobcats are nesting kind of all throughout Santa Fe, so we get calls about that a lot. Um, and we do see uh, that we have calls about parents that have been hit by cars or obviously found dead, and people who know that there's kittens or coyote pups that this mother was taking care of. That's generally the most common reason we get bobcat kittens. We get calls about someone who says, we found a dead mother on the side of the road and she had a kitten with her. And that's when we'll get those in. They're another one that they're relatively sensitive to rehabilitation. And so we try to keep them with their parents as much as possible as well. Um, the thing about bobcats and coyotes is there is a really big disease and injury risk. Um, so we always tell people to call uh, Gavin Fish to get assistance with capturing and transporting those animals to us because there is a risk uh, with that. Bears, uh, we do not take bears. We do not have any enclosures large enough for bears, but we work a lot with uh, Dr. Ramsey at Cottonwood Clinic and she takes bears there. Um, and so we always tell people to either call Game and Fish or Cottonwood Clinic. Um, and generally a Game and Fish officer will go out and ensure that this bear is in fact orphaned before it's removed. Um, and then it'll be brought to Cottonwood Clinic. Anything to add? Mm, I don't think so. Probably and we should dive into like questions about this kind of thing. Yes, definitely. Um, and when all else fails, call your local licensed wildlife rehabilitator to determine the best course of action. That's the best thing you can do. Questions? Thanks so much, ladies. Um, there's not really a lot of questions that have come in. Um, you guys were very thoroughly covering the topics and it's super interesting. Um, there was, we would, we were putting up some resources in the chat so they could find your website and then actually find the uh, links to those really cool little flow charts because those are super, super helpful to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And something I always recommend to people is to save our phone number in your phone under New Mexico Wildlife Center. You never know when you're going to be out hiking and you find an animal and then you're going to have to like frantically go online and find and it's one of those situations where if you're in an emergency situation your cell phone's not going to have service you're not going to be able to find anything you're going to be frantically lost with a orphaned baby skunk and not know what to do with it so save our phone number in your phone and then you can easily just give us a call if anything happens cool okay that's a great idea can you talk a little bit about you had mentioned that um, with raccoons and skunks, it's great for people to go in beforehand and seal up those holes before baby season happens. But are there other things that people can do to help um, wildlife in general, whether it's mammals or reptiles, um, to help keep them from becoming in, in, in one of these situations where they would need to be rehabilitated? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There are some ways that you can help. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Let's see, I'm going to talk about specific circumstances and kind of how people can help, but just kind of going back to nuisance wildlife in your yards and how to kind of uh, coexist with wildlife. Um, there's a few things you can do to kind of help keep your property free of wildlife that you don't necessarily want on there. And the biggest thing you can do is ensure that there's no food on your property. So we get a lot of calls about, uh, you know, raccoons on your property or bears or anything that is just going to go to where the food is. Um, and so we always tell people to take down your bird feeders, uh, make sure your garbage cans are in a location that wildlife can't get to it. So in a garage or in a covered shed. Um, and just trying to prevent your home from being a really great place for wildlife. Wildlife are going to look for a few things. They're going to look for food, they're going to look for shelter, and they're going to look for water. And if you take away those three things from your, from your home from them, 
then you're not going to have as much nuisance wildlife um, on your property. Um, so that's just a good way of kind of getting rid of those nuisance species. Um, and then I think I might answer your question with the next few slides about specific wildlife circumstances and kind of how you can prevent them and what you can do if you're in that situation. And if I don't answer your question, we can kind of come back to it and I can expand on it a little bit more. And I'll just add a little bit about um, you want to think about like what sort of ecosystem you're creating like in your yard and also adjacent to your home or like in that garage you don't really want them in but there's some like loose pieces of stuff around it. Uh, so we want to make sure that they don't have the shelter that you don't want them to have. Um, so like you might want to have an area of your yard that's more like a natural oasis type of area where you can watch the birds and you can like have a place for wildlife to be, um, but you wanna make sure that the other parts of your home are more secure um, so that you don't have those animals getting in there and you surprise each other um, mm -hmm. suddenly. So uh, to avoid those kinds of things, just think about, um, you know, as we talk about wildlife, the things that they're looking for, that food, water, shelter, um, we wanna make sure that we don't have that in areas where you don't want them. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so we're, I'm going to just highlight some of the common calls we get and common uh, reasons why we have patients admitted. We talked a little bit about the fires, but I know this was specifically requested. Like Dr. Sarah said, we haven't had a lot of animals um, admitted specifically because of the fires, um, but we know they're out there. We know that there's animals that are being displaced by the fires and being impacted by them. Um, and oftentimes we'll see that as an animal that is dazed, if they've inhaled a lot of smoke, um, then you're going to see them a little bit dazed, possibly having respiratory issues. Um, you might see animals that have burns or just generally out of place, an animal that is not in a place where it should be. Um, and that's when you should call your local wildlife officer or us um, for advice to determine if this animal does need uh, intervention. Anything to add? No. Um, hit by car is one of the most common causes of, bring, of animals coming to our center, primarily raptors. We see a lot of raptors that were hit by cars. Raptors don't quite understand that they need to look both ways before they cross the street. And so they'll see a little rodent running in a shoulder and go right for it and get hit by a car. Um, now, one thing you can do to help wildlife avoid being hit by cars is by not throwing things out your window. And this is kind of goes back to the, the food chain here. If you throw a apple core out your window, you're going to attract a rodent. A rodent is going to come and try to eat that apple core and get hit by the car. If it's dead after being hit by the car, you're going to get scavengers coming in. Scavengers coming in are going to be hit by cars. If that rodent comes and tries to eat that thing and doesn't die right away, you're going to get raptors coming in and trying to eat it. Um, so it just draws in all this wildlife right to a location where you do not want wildlife. So never throw food out the window. I know it's just a common, you know, thing that you're like, oh, this is part of nature. I'll just throw it back, back into nature. But unfortunately, you're throwing it right next to the road. And that is where we're going to see issues. Um, and if you or you, someone you know or you find a raptor in the middle of a highway, um, get it to a rehabilitation facility immediately. Even if it appears to be healthy, it likely had some kind of head trauma or it's stunned or just needs some oxygen and some, some uh, treatment. And then uh, hopefully it'll be released. We do get a lot of raptors that have wing fractures uh, from being hit by cars. Luckily, we're just talking about that turkey vulture that was hit by a car. Um, he didn't suffer anything massively. He's been in our care for a week. He's doing pretty well. And we're hopeful that in another week or so, he'll be released back into the wild. Um, so that's always what we hope is that we'll get in animals that don't need much treatment and we just give them a little TLC and they go right back out. Um, but it's always best if you find an animal on the side of a highway who was probably hit by a car and needs to be brought to a facility. Um, I'll just add, especially in the wintertime, we talked about our, how things change in the wintertime. Uh, we see a lot of owls in particular that are hit by a car. Um, you know, they're, they're hunting primarily with their ears and not necessarily their eyes. So they're for sure not looking out for a car. Um, and the little mice or whatever road that they're trying to track down um, happens to dart out in the road. And then here comes the owl. And they're so fast. And truly, we cannot even hear them mm -hmm. um, because they have special adaptations with their feathers so that they are truly silent. Um, and so um, it's a really common problem where they get hit by a car, especially in the winter time. Um, and then they come in with a broken humerus. Um, but um, it's something to watch out for as much as you can. Um, and just be aware of that there are those changes in the winter time. Mm -hmm. 
caught by cat. Um, this is the most common reason for admission aside from orphan and a lot of orphans come in because of the fact that their parents were killed by cats. Um, our, as I've already said, always bring a uh, animal that was caught by a cat to a wildlife rehabilitator. It means that they're, they have been exposed to all kinds of bacteria. There might be tiny little fractures or internal bleeding or things that you can't see. They should always get to a rehabilitator. Hopefully it gets here and we say, wow, yeah, there wasn't really anything that wrong with it. Give it some antibiotics and it's back out the door. Um, but most of the time we get in some animals that have severe injuries from being caught by a cat. And our recommendation is always keep cats inside, please. Um, it's so absolutely heartbreaking how many animals we get brought in that have been caught by people's outside cats. Um, and there are so many resources out there on how to transition cats from outside life to inside life, how to give them an enriched life inside. Um, it doesn't need to be an outside cat um, to have a happy life and it'll save a lot more wildlife as well. And there's also things like catios, those little like mm -hmm. enclosed patio things that people have been making that are getting really popular. And you can find tons of DIY uh, uh, instructions for that mm -hmm. online as well. Yep. Okay, window collision. And feel free to kind of interrupt on any slide if there's any questions about any specific slide. Um, but window collisions here. Uh, so that's another common reason we get animals brought to our hospital. There's a lot of birds will not see a window and slam right into it. Um, and there are some modifications you can do to help this issue. It's never perfect. I've used a lot of these methods before and I still had a couple birds who would bounce off the window, but for the most part, um, it does help. There's uh, window markers that you can use to kind of create little nice little patterns. Um, you can get tape uh, to put on your windows or um, kind of these uh, like UV decals. Yeah, UV that's decals. What used, yeah. Mm -hmm, that's what I've used. Um, I know the only thing that we always recommend is that they're uh, no more than an inch or two apart um, because a bird will see that inch or two and think that's a hole I can go through. Um, so you got to put those kind of decals pretty close together for them to be effective. And we have some brochures here um, at the center with some of those recommendations that an intern made to it for us, which was fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of resources online too. If you look um, prevent bird window strike, lots of little ideas. Um, and just like with a cat caught, anytime an animal, hit, a bird hits a window, bring it to a wildlife rehabilitator. Even if you think it's starting to kind of bounce back, sometimes there might be head trauma or lung trauma that you can't see, um, that they need to have some kind of treatment in an oxygen chamber, an incubator, and some kind of medication to help them bounce back. And it's also a really common way for them to get shoulder injuries. They've got three different bones that sort of work in a uh, concert with each other to help them fly. Um, and when they hit the window, usually near their sternum or their shoulders, it's really frequent for them to, to have a fracture there. Um, and lots of times that heals just with time and a little bit of supportive care. Um, and so it's, it's useful to know that that can happen. So caught in wire or glue trap and mesh. I kind of grouped all these together. Um, so glue traps in general are just an incredibly inhumane uh, form of pest control. And I'll talk about another different forms of pest control in a second. But just know that glue traps are one of the worst ways to go. Um, it's a really slow, painful process for any animal that gets trapped into it. Um, and wildlife rehabilitation centers all over the country post all the time about animals that that get brought in that have been caught in glue traps that were not the target animal. Um, and so if you do find an animal that has been stuck in a glue trap, uh, we oftentimes get songbirds or uh, little rodents or snakes that have been caught in glue traps. Um, bring it to a wildlife rehabilitator still in that glue trap. Um, what you can do is you can sprinkle some flour around the animal on that glue trap so it doesn't continue to get stuck on different parts. Um, but we get a lot of animals brought to us where people have tried to get it out of the glue trap and have either used a ton of oil, which is damaged feathers or some kind of body part, or they've caused more injury by pulling the animal off the glue trap. And so we have some special ways of getting these animals off of glue traps that minimizes the damage to the animal. That's kind of also with wire and any kind of mesh that an animal is caught in. We get a lot of great horned owls that are caught in barbed wire in the winter. That is a really common thing that we see. 
Um, and when people try to remove them themselves, oftentimes it can cause more damage to wings. Um, so if it's possible, we recommend that people kind of cut around the wire or mesh and bring the animal in with that kind of wrapped around it so that we can kind of work carefully around the bones and feathers and skin to minimize any damage. And rodenticides and poisons. So again, I talked about glue traps as being pretty inhumane. Um, there are some other humane options aside from glue traps and rodenticides. Um, and there's an organization called RATS. Raptors are the solution. Um, they are a wonderful organization that has a lot of information on their website about different humane options of pest control. So ways that will target the pests that you want, but will not target other animals ways that will quickly end the life of those pests that you're targeting, but will not kind of prolong that period. Um, so R-A-T-S, Raptors are the solution, is a fantastic uh, website to look at for that. Um, and we do get some animals that have, have uh, shown signs of rodenticide or toxicity of some sort. Um, and generally they act unstable. You can tell that there's something just not quite right with the animal. They're not very alert when you walk up to them. They're not responding to you. Um, and generally that's a sign that there's some severe uh, damage going on internally and they need to get to a wildlife rehabilitation center to undergo some treatment to get rid of that toxicity. Um, we get a lot of lead toxicity, um, which obviously is not a poison or a rodenticide that is used to target pests, um, but it's, a, it's another thing that you'll see pretty obviously if an animal has lead, lead toxicity, they're going to be pretty weak, um, unstable, and just not quite acting like themselves. And sometimes when they have that toxicity, that puts them more at risk. So uh, one of the most common reasons that eagles get hit by a car is because they're dazed from the toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've got the toxicity first and then they put themselves in harm's way and then they've got multiple problems. Hmm. Any questions about that? We don't have any questions about what you've just covered on those items, but a few have just come in and I think you're probably going to cover that right now, but um, somebody was asking about how many wildlife rehab centers are in New Mexico and if you guys have a donation link like the animal shelters do. Yes, I will get to both of those. Um, so we talked about kind of when an animal might, might need your help. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, I know this animal needs help now, I know I need to get this animal to a rehabilitation center, what do you do? And so there's kind of four steps to this. The first is you call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. We always recommend you call ahead of time to make sure that they are equipped to take the animal that you have and to see if they have any advice specific for your situation. The second thing you're going to do is capture that animal. And then you're going to hold that animal for a short period of time and transport it to the center. So I'll kind of go through the details of that. So first, calling a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Before we dive into that, I want to talk about why it's important to get an animal to a wildlife rehabilitator and not keep it to try and treat it yourself. So firstly, it's illegal. Um, like we talked about, we have a lot of permits here that allow us to be able to have rehabilitation on site um, and education animals. Um, it is illegal to rehabilitate animals without a, without a permit. It's also illegal to keep wild animals as pets. And it is illegal to possess any part or whole of native birds without the correct permit. So there's a lot of um, legalities surrounding this. And also when it comes to rehabilitation, it is just not the best thing for the animal to not be in the care of a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Our wildlife rehabilitators are certified. They go through an extensive training process. Um, they have continuing education to make sure we have the most modern treatment methods here. Like we talked about with the songbirds, we have very specialized formulas that we use for all of our babies, specialized um, medical procedures that are done for them. Um, and we get a lot of people who bring us animals that they've tried to care for for a month before bringing it to us. And they generally have to be euthanized on the spot because of the fact that they're this caused more harm than good. Um, and so getting an animal to a wildlife rehabilitator as fast as possible is the best thing to do. And there are a few in New Mexico. Um, so we are located um, just north of Santa Fe, just south of Española. Um, and we serve the entire state. So we will take animals from all over the state of New Mexico. We have an extensive volunteer transport system. Um, we have transporters all over the state that can help bring wildlife to us if people are unable to. Um, there are 
Also two wildlife rehabilitation centers in the southern part of the state, one in Silver City, one in Carlsbad. Um, and both of those are wildlife rehabilitation centers that take, I think, all types of wildlife yeah. for the most part. And we do, we do communicate with all of these rehabilitation centers. And uh, there's a lot of kind of transfer of animals uh, depending on what capacity the centers have. So we'll take in large raptors um, if another facility doesn't have the flight space for it, and we know we do. So we communicate a lot. And then in Albuquerque, there's Wildlife Rescue Inc. Uh, and they do a lot of songbirds from Albu Albuquerque, a lot of doves and pigeons and all that, that kind of thing. Um, but we work closely with them as well. And there's nine licensed uh, state licensed wildlife rehabilitators listed through Game and Fish. That number changes a little bit year over year. So um, if you're not near any of these, uh, we'll give you some, uh, some websites to go to, but also you can just call us and we can help direct you. Yep. That's always the, the first thing you can do is call us and we will always help figure out what the best situation is for the animal. Um, so that's what I just said. Um, you're always welcome to call us. Um, like I said, we have transporters all throughout the state um, and we are one of the best equipped in terms of medical procedures. Um, so we, uh, we can definitely take the animals. Now, I know some uh, people might be outside of New Mexico. Uh, we are only permitted to care for wild animals found in New Mexico. Um, each state's wildlife department generally has a list of licensed wildlife rehabilitators that can be found throughout the state. Um, so there's some in Arizona, Colorado, and Texas. I put a few links there. Um, and then there's also a website called Wildlife Help Now um, that you can go to to find a wildlife rehabilitator basically anywhere in the country. Um, and I do want to point out that it's very important to go to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Um, there are some people who might say that they're equipped to uh, rehabilitate wildlife, but if they're not properly permitted, first of all, it's not legal. And secondly, it means that they don't have any regulations ensuring that they're using proper methods. Um, so finding those licensed wildlife rehabilitators is going to be the best, uh, the best outcome for that wild animal. So first, call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Second, capture the animal. Um, so capturing different animals uh, is different depending on the situation. But in general, um, remember, raptors are very sharp. They have sharp talons and sharp beaks. Um, so we always recommend that people wear either protective uh, leather welding or gardening gloves, whatever you have on hand. Um, you can also just use a towel, blanket, or jacket to throw over the bird. That's generally the best way of capturing a raptor is just throwing kind of whatever kind of large fabric you have on hand and using two people to kind of corral the raptor is easier. And then that raptor should go into a secure box um, where it cannot get out. Small mammals. Um, so don't touch any mammals with bare hands. There is a risk of disease transmission with some mammals. So we always recommend don't touch it with bare hands. Um, you can scoop small mammals up with blankets or towels and put them in a box with a secure lid. Uh, snakes, non-rattlesnakes, are generally safe to just scoop and place in a bucket or a box. Um, you can use a stick or some other long object to avoid getting bites. Even though they are not rattlesnakes, they will still strike and bite. Um, so that is something to note. And then there are kind of two groups of animals that we do not recommend anyone try to capture on their own, and that is larger dangerous mammals. Um, there's a huge risk of disease transmission between the mammal and the human, and a risk of injury for both the human and the animal. Um, the large mammals can oftentimes die from stress um, when they're being um, pursued in terms of a capture. Um, so it's really, it's really important to get them as fast and uh, carefully as possible. So what you can do is you can call your local wildlife processor to capture and transport. Um, and if you're not able to get a hold of one, you can also call us and we can assist in finding that. Rattlesnakes, for obvious reasons, are another one that are not very safe to capture on your own. Um, but you can call Animal Control, Game and Fish, or um, we do have a list of local rescuers that can help to capture and transport uh, rattlesnakes. Holding. So once you have that animal safely in your possession, it's important to get it to a rehabilitation center as soon as possible. It's illegal to hold wild animals longer than absolutely necessary. And like I said, we do have transporters all over the state that can help get those animals to us if you are not able to. Um, if you do need to keep it in your home for a period of time, keep it in a secure box with airflow, and it needs to be in a dark, quiet, temperature-regulated 
regulated location until you're able to transport it. Um, it's important to not look at or touch the animal and to minimize any disturbance while it's in, your, in holding. Um, it's also important not to feed or give water to any of the animals. Animals with head trauma or injury can drown in any amount of water that they're provided um, and they can die from the incorrect diet. So it's important to not feed or water and get them to a rehabilitator as soon as possible. Um, and the only thing I'll add to that is, um, in addition to being a dark, quiet space, you don't want them to be sharing space with your domestic or livestock animals. Uh, they're, sometimes they don't even have to be in contact. You can have a flea jump from the wild animal onto your domestic animal, um, and we don't want to have any disease spread in that way. Uh, so making sure that uh, they're kept separate, and also if that is, we frequently have animals come in in dog or cat carriers or crates, um, making sure that that container has been cleaned before it's used again uh, for your animals. And transport. So be sure to keep it in a secure box during transport. You would not imagine the number of animals that have escaped in transport to our center into people's cars. I do fish a screech owl out of a dashboard one time. Um, so please keep the animals secure in the box in your car so that we do not have that issue. Um, keep the noise down in your vehicle during transport. So minimize talking and radio or anything like that. And keep the temperature at a comfortable level. During the summer, make sure it's not too hot. During the winter, make sure it's nice and warm for those animals. And lastly, um, and then I'll turn it over for questions. I know we're like pushing the time here. Um, some ways that you can help New Mexico Wildlife Center. I know we've got some hunters and anglers here. Um, we love game meat and fish donations. We have so many carnivores here that go through so much meat and fish. We have three golden eagles and we have some bobcats and coyotes and you would, you would not imagine the amount of meat those animals eat. Um, and it helps keep, keep our costs down by having game meat and fish donated to us. So we do work with a, a fish hatchery um, and they donate a lot of fish to us, um, but we, we very much appreciate hunters who come bring us um, some extra uh, elk, deer, or anything you have, as long as it's not seasoned um, and as long as it's not freezer burned, uh, we can take it. Or shot with lead. Or shot with lead, yes. Um, so. Those are kind of our, our uh, stipulations, but we appreciate all those donations we can get. Um, I mentioned our big team of transporters all over the state. If you're interested in helping become a transporter, you can reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box here. I am the uh, volunteer coordinator. Take some thought process because this is a very long email. Okay. Um, so if you're interested in being a transporter volunteer or a volunteer at our center, um, you can send me an email and I can give you more information about that. We rely heavily on volunteers to operate. Um, you can also donate via our website. Um, and so that's one place you can donate. You can also call and donate by phone, send us a check. There's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, another way you can help is just by following us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, kind of. Um, I'm working on TikTok. Not quite that generation, uh, but I'm getting there. Um, so follow us on that. We're very active on Facebook and Instagram. We post five days a week, some very cute videos. All the videos that did not play in this PowerPoint yeah. right now will be I'm viewable <laughs> on social media. Um, and so we post success stories, release videos, pictures of our ambassador animals, education programs. It's just a, a heartwarming, a heartwarming feed. Um, and I think that's all I have for you all. Do you have any questions? About the only one I can think of, um, since we're kind of on this slide, is you do have um, that up here that you are very happy to have volunteers come help you. Um, can you maybe highlight some of the more specific or maybe the top three things that a volunteer who's interested in helping you guys, what are some of those just basic duties that they can help you with? Yeah, so we have, um, I think about four different type of volunteers, so different uh, volunteer positions. The two most common ones are our education volunteers and our hospital volunteers. So our hospital volunteers help out with um, kind of every aspect of the center on that side. So helping out with diet prep, um, clean, keeping things clean, laundry, dishes, helping to hold animals during medical procedures, 
cleaning enclosures during baby season. They help with feeding the songbirds that need to be fed every 15 minutes um, and takes up a lot of our time. Um, so volunteers are very, very much appreciated right now. Um, we're very short on volunteers and interns this year. Um, and so we're looking for as many volunteers as we can have uh, for, on that side to help out with baby season. In terms of our education side, our education volunteers help with taking care of our ambassador animals. So cleaning enclosures and diet prep, um, but also do a lot more one-on-one -on -one interactions with those animals. Um, so those animals go to offsite uh, school presentations and onsite education programs. So getting them used to as many people as possible. Um, we use all uh, positive reinforcement choice-based training with our animals. Um, and so that does take a lot of time. So making sure that relationships are built between the ambassador animals and volunteers before they start working on behaviors with them. Um, so that's something really fun that our volunteers get to be a part of is developing those relationships and new behaviors with the animals. Um, and then they also help with education programs. So we train them on our material and they help talk to visitors on site and do education education programs on site and off site. So those are kind of the two most common volunteers that help out. Um, we also very, very, very much appreciate facilities and grounds volunteers. If anyone has construction experience or enjoys gardening or anything like that, that is an area of the center that kind of falls behind. The animals take priority, which means a lot of the other things don't, including the plants that live on site. Um, and so having people that do want to focus on that is really, really helpful for us. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that was about all we had in the chat. Did anybody else catch something that I might have missed? No, I don't think you missed anything. There was a lot of people that said how awesome you guys are and what great work you're doing and how much they appreciated the information. And, and I would echo those and say thank you so much. Yes, this has been an amazingly educational um, conversation. So we certainly appreciate your guys' efforts. This is a wealth of knowledge. And I know that there's several folks that were either unable to make it or had to leave because of other um, commitments. So it's really exciting that we have the ability to, to have recorded this. So those can, this will be out there for those that uh, missed tonight's conversation live. Absolutely. I put my email in the chat. And so if anybody has any follow up questions or wants to know more information, feel free to email me. I'm happy to respond and, and give you lots of information. Um, there's a, a comment in the chat about the endotracheal tube in the uh, snake, I think. And we do intubate a lot of really <laughs> tiny patients. Um, sometimes they don't make the intubation tube small enough. Uh, so we end up using IV catheters um, or other. Uh, sterile objects <laughs> to to be uh, an intubation tube. Uh, so there's a lot of creativity that goes into rehabilitation um, and working with these tiny animals, but we do our best to take the very best care of all of them. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we appreciate um, all the love from you guys for sure. And uh, my email is also um, on the website, but it's just Sarah at New Mexico Wildlife Center that works. So if anybody has any uh, specific questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime too. Fabulous. Thank you guys. Uh, Absolutely. Anything, anything else from our audience before we wrap up this evening's conversation? Just want to say thank you ladies so much. This was great. And I think um, our hunting community would be more than willing to kind of help you guys out any way that we can. And we're glad that there's some folks like you that are helping wildlife um, as much as you guys can. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us here to talk all about what we do and how you can help. We always appreciate these opportunities. Yeah, we want to build up these networks and, you know, do everything from uh, the individual patient to the wide population and mm -hmm. do the best we can for wildlife in our state in general. Great. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody so much. I think we can probably call it a wrap at this point because I don't see anything else other than amazing um, comments that you guys are rock stars and your awesome presentation and extremely educational. So um, that's all <laughs> super awesome. So, um, but yeah, thank you ladies so much for, for doing this. It's been really neat and very educational. So 
um, with that, I guess we can bid everybody a good evening. Thanks again. And um, yeah, hopefully we can uh, work together to educate folks about wild, wildlife rehabilitation and, and give them some better pointers on what they can and can't do. So, hey, Jen. Yes, absolutely. Do you, do you want to make an intro for next month's um, oh. topic? Yes, thank you. So um, next month will, is July and we're gonna shift gears from wildlife over to um, safe and responsible use uh, on an off highway vehicle. So it doesn't matter if you're using an ATV, a side-by-side, -side, a dirt bike, snowmobile, if you have any of those types of machines um, either used for hunting, angling, or maybe just outdoor recreation, we highly encourage anybody to join us next time on July 19th. And um, part of that conversation will be, um, it's going to be by Desi Ortiz and Christopher Johnson, who is our OHV team at the moment. And um, some of that conversation, whether it's going to be policies and just following some basic rules to safety and education, how you can, can you get you and your family involved with off highway vehicle education and safe and proper land use um, and responsible use of the OHV um, as it pertains to, you know, the environment and the land. Um, so going to be pretty, pretty good conversation for sure. Um, next go around. So hopefully we can see everybody next month, which is tomorrow already. <laughs> I can't believe it's going to be July. I'm like, whatever happened to June and May and 2022 already. <laughs> so, but, well, thanks. Thanks everybody so much. Tell everybody about July's uh, conversation and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Sounds good. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a great night.